All right. Yeah, it's a couple of days late uh, due to can games, but I do want to get this done so that way uh, by next um, live stream when we start talking about um, uh, the war summary from the 19th of May to the 25th of May, it's not going to be too much of a break. That'll be for live stream 76 coming up. And the nice thing is I started cluing in with this uh, record function for um, uh, through uh, StreamYard. I can actually hit the pause button at one point and uh, take a little bit of a break and uh, hopefully it won't be too much of a, uh, we'll see, but anyways, we'll see how it goes. So here we go, uh, May 12th, 1916. And like I said, uh, as we go on, you'll see the dates change because sometimes it's like, wait a minute, wasn't there something we just talked about, um, you know, on the Western Front or whatever? And it's it's because it's day by day, kind of thing, as you got, as you well imagine. Anyways, here we go. An infantry attack, and I'm also going to say uh, ahead of time, I apologize. I'm hopefully going to get better over time, but uh, I'm sure I'm going to butcher some words with my pronunciation. I'll, like I said, I'm going to try to get better. Uh, an infantry attack on the French lines near Vaux was repulsed early on Thursday morning. The German guns afterwards took up the work of preparation for another assault and continued hammering away throughout the day on both sides of the Meuse. The French midnight report says that the cannonade was quite violent in the Avocourt sector west of the river, while on the east the bombardment was directed against the French trenches in the Calet woods on, and on the second line of defense. The Crown Prince relies more on his guns now than on his infantry. The idea of taking Verdun by assault in massed formations seems to have been discarded, and the German infantry is sent forward only when it is believed the trenches to be attacked have been practically wiped out of existence together with their occupants by high explosives. In the artillery war, the French are no longer at the great disadvantage under which the lab they labored in February and the beginning of March when the Verdun operations began. Then the Germans had at least a dozen, perhaps many more howitzers of 16 and 17.7 .7 inch caliber mounted on the north front of the city. The French cannon were pop guns in comparison, but of late they have brought up the 14 inch naval guns mounted on railway trucks. While still outranged by the big German pieces, these great French guns fire shells containing huge quantities of high explosives, which bursting as they do in the regions where German troops are held awaiting orders to attack, must cause the enemy very serious losses. How many heavy pieces of artillery and eight inch caliber of eight inch caliber and over the Germans have in action at Verdun is a matter of guesswork. Critics express the view that in the sector of the Meuse there are probably 200 German heavy guns. Sorry, I hit a pause button to drink some coffee. So I didn't uh, clue in, so you may have noticed a bit of a weird break there, sorry. The tendency is toward a further increase of caliber. Artillery experts of the United States Army Earth are authority for the statement that the Krupp Company claimed to have perfected a gun with a caliber of 21 and one quarter inches, which can throw a shell 38 miles, which is what? That's a lot of Valkyrie hexes, isn't it? This may seem incredible, but no one believed that German 16-inch gun had a longer range than the British naval 15-inch weapon until the Germans demonstrated the range of their gun by dropping shells into Dunkirk from a point believed to be 22 miles uh, from that city. Um, we've got to find out here. I've got to hit the hold. Uh, all right, just checked again. So that was three hexes, uh, the 38 miles, and this is about a hex and a half. Holy smokes. The most revolutionary feature in the alleged new Krupp gun is not the length of range, but the tremendous capacity of its shell as a vehicle for the transmission of a charge of high explosives. The British 12-inch naval gun discharges a projectile weighing 830 pounds. An addition of four and a quarter inches to the caliber increases the weight of the projectile to 2,200 pounds. If a 16 and one quarter inch gun can discharge a projectile weighing, weighing 2,200 pounds, it would seem that every inch added to the caliber between 16 and one quarter and 21 and one quarter inches would permit a, of an addition of from three to 400 pounds to the weight of the projectile. The new Krupp gun, therefore, will throw a shell weighing almost 4,000 pounds, half of which weight at least will consist of high explosives. Such a gun located on Hamilton Mountain would drop a ton of melanite of, or gun cotton on any selected part of West Toronto. The destructive power of such a shell would be tremendous. It is <clears throat> by long range high explosive bombardment that the Germans hope ultimately to blast their way into Verdun. 
General Smuts announces that the Germans in East Africa have received reinforcements and are again advancing towards British positions in the Kondoa Rangi district, where he adds, our forces are quite sufficient to deal with them. Sharp fighting may be expected soon. The rains are abating. The Belgian invasion, General Smuts reports, has progressed satisfactorily, despite the natural difficulties of the country increased by the race recent rainfall. A dispatch from Rotterdam to the London Daily Telegraph emphasizes the German meat shortage. Everybody gets food, but millions are underfed and conditions are steadily becoming worse. The British Navy is not making much noise, but it is doing its work effectively. Sir Douglas Haig, in his report, tells of an unsuccessful attempt by the enemy to raid the British trenches near Orvier of mining activity at various points and of a severe mutual bombardment at the Houghton's Hall. Oh, gosh, I always screw that one up. Houghton Zollern readout. The Germans, by their incessant activity west and southwest of Lille, betray their fear that the possession of that city and the mining district to the south will be challenged before long by the British Navy. During the last 24 hours, the Germans have thrice attacked the French lines north of Verdun. On each occasion, they were completely repulsed. Not only so, but in the region of Dead Man's Hill, the French Midnight Report says minor engagements fought during the course of the day enabled us to enlarge our positions materially. The German bombardment of the French lines between Houdremont and Vaux was continued, but a German attack southeast of Douaumont failed entirely. After eight days of heavy fighting on both sides of the river, the French hold practically the same lines as they occupied a week ago, save on the northern slope of Hill 304, where the enemy have made a slight gain. The gain is so unimportant that the French have not considered it necessary to waste life and efforts to recover the lost ground. The occasional capture of a few French trenches encourages the Germans to keep on trying for Verdun, and the longer the German offensive lasts, the better pleased Papa Joffre will be. He does not need to nibble them when they nibble themselves. That philosophy does not apply to the capture of some British trenches near the Hohen Zollern readout north of Luss, reported by Berlin. With the trenches, were taken 127 prisoners and several machine guns. Every foot of ground in this region is important and doubly important if the Allies have designs on Lille. The British official report dealing with this attack says that 500 yards of first line trenches were taken by the Germans northeast of Vermeil by infantry attack on Thursday evening following a heavy preliminary bombardment. The report adds, we regained a portion of the ground lost by a counterattack during the night. There were no infantry actions yesterday, but a good deal of artillery activity has developed in the neighborhood. There are signs that the Belgians, who have been left practically unmolested in their lines along the Yasser since last fall, are once more to face a German attempt to advance toward Dunkirk. Yesterday, after a heavy bombardment, their lines at Dixmude were attacked, but the Germans failed to score. The G Belgian artillery is very efficient and it is freely used. The Yasser lines are reasonably safe. News from Petro Petrograd by way of Berlin dealing with the Greek politics is to be taken with salt. If the statement alleged to have come from the Petrograd official press bureau that the Allies will use force to secure passage from Serbian troops on the Greek railways en route from Corfu to Salonika is true, stirring times are ahead in Greece. It is believed the government of Greece persists in its refusal because of the fear that Germany will win the war and will inflict penalties on Greece for any action now taken that can be regarded as an infringement of the principle of nationality. Will Greece resist the Allies to the shedding of blood? That would appear to be improbable. The army has been partially demobilized and Venizelos's influence grows stronger daily. Orders from the pro-German Greek staff to fire on the Serbs and on the Franco-British forces might prove the signal for a revolution that would leave King Constantine without a throne. The government of Greece is confronted with circumstances that mean war or a surrender to the threats of the Allies to use force will surrender. A review of the Russian operations on the Tur Turkish-Persian border indicates that the Turks are likely to regain their... I'm sorry, it's really hard to read to realign their armies in Mesopotamia to meet the Russian army advances on, advancing on Baghdad from the mountains of Luristan. That army has now traversed the wild hill country on the frontier and is approaching the strongly fortified Turkish base at Kanilkin. 
that the hasty retreat of the Turks before the, the Russian advance seems to imply that the, Rus that the forces defending Kinilkan have been greatly overestimated. The Turkish troops released by the capitulation of Kut have not yet transferred to the Persian frontier to assist the hard-pressed Turkish army there, and it's quite possible that the Kinilkan may be taken with a rush. Close cooperation between Sir Percy Lake and the Russian commander east of Baghdad would greatly facilitate the operations of both the British and Russians. If any large proportion of the Turkish army now confronting, confronting General Lake is withdrawn, he will be in a position to fight his way up the Tigris towards Baghdad while the Russians are closing in on the city from the east. The Turkish army of the Tigris must face its two foes without hope of material help from Constantinople. All the troops that can be spared from the capital are being sent forward to the Black Sea coastal region west of Trezeban, where the Russians have again resumed their advance to Erzingen, with which the Turkish center defends with resolution and skill. The next great battle in the Armenian war theater will take place in this region. If the Turks lose Erzingen and Diyarbakir, what happens meanwhile on the Tigris will be a matter of comparative unimportance for the evacuation of Mesopotamia will become an absolute necessity. There has been heavy fighty, fighting on the Vina in the region of Jakastat. The Germans have concentrated many guns there and are trying to force a way to, forward to the, the river by blasting operations. The Russians are holding their position steadily in the face of a very violent bombardment. The subsidence of the spring floods in Kurland enables the enemy to make effective use of its superior strength and heavy guns. There's talk also of a combined land and sea attack on Riga. This might well be accompanied by aggressive German action farther up the river. I'm gonna pause. And back again. There's been fierce fighting in Armenia, not only in the direction of Erzingen, but also towards the Black Sea coast in the region of Bybert. The Turks have been strongly reinforced in the center and have on several occasions sought to break the Russian lines. On Saturday, the war office at Petrograd announced the capture of 30 officers and 365 Turkish soldiers following upon a night attack powerfully organized by the enemy on a, on a lofty range dominating the whole adjoining region. After this check, the Turks brought up reinforcements, again assumed the offensive, and after a desperate fight which lasted the whole of Sunday, compelled the Russian advance guards to retire in some places. Finally, the Turks ceased their attack because of the extremely heavy losses inflicted by the Russian fire. While these endeavors to stop the Russian advance were taking place in the center, the left wing of the Russian army was sweeping forward in the direction of Mosul on the Tigris. There, in an engagement which lasted two days, the enemy detachments were defeated, and during a precipitate, precipitate retreat, abandoned three guns and some war material. The right wing of the Russian main army, which is seeking to get into touch with the troops landed on the Black Sea coast in the neighborhood of Trebizond, are driving the Turks before them in the direction of Bybert. During an action on Sunday, the Turkish troops who attacked the Russians there suffered heavy losses. On the whole, the operations of the Grand Duke's army, oh gosh, this is great when you hear this. Uh, uh, on the whole, the operations of the Grand Duke's army in Armenia and in Mesopotamia are proceeding with almost clock-like regularity. The experience gained by the commander-in-chief in Poland and Galicia enables him to move forward the various parts of his long battlefront as a chess player moves his pieces. The action in the direction of Erzingen yesterday, in which the Turks compelled the Russian advance guards to retire in some places, is the first since the campaign began in February in which the Russian forces have given ground. Operations on the European Russian front are not, are not important. The Germans have been showing great activity in the region of the Pripyat marshes. Petrograd reports that in some places this activity has led to bayonet attacks, but all attempts of the enemy to approach the Russian trenches have been frustrated. The struggle upon the west bank of the Meuse has once more died down. On Saturday afternoon, the German bombardment diminished in activity and an attack directed against the French positions to the west of Hill 304 and on the slope northeast of Dead Man's Hill was completely repulsed. After this check, the Germans resumed their bombardment, but no infantry action occurred there on Saturday night or throughout Sunday. Senator hum Humbert, vice president of the French Senate Army Commission, so I guess Humbert, uh, Vice President of the French Senate Army Commission declares that still more heavy guns are needed to give the give France the victory. 
The situation, he says, demands feverish efforts to bring to an end the frightful nightmare of the war. The senator points to the effect produced by the enormous projectiles of the Germans of the Verdun Front and declares that only heavy artillery equal to that of the foe and as numerous and efficient can quell his terrific bombardment. The startling statement is made that the French army still needs 10 times as much heavy artillery as it has to bring this branch of the service up to the level of the infantry. In field guns, the French are incomparably superior to their enemies, but Senator Humbert's statement indicates that there is still great need for the heavy artillery in which the Germans so greatly excelled when the war began. Lloyd George's recent impassioned appeal to the men of the Tyne and the Clyde for more sustained effort had, beh had behind it a very great basis of need. Most of the heavy guns produced in Great Britain are turned out in the Northumbrian and Lancashire armament works. Concentration of heavy gun making ought to produce in a very short time a greater equality between the forces of the Allies and those of the enemy. In the face of Senator Humbert's plea, all talks of strikes and other industrial disturbances on the Tyne and the Clyde should cease. The Germans are bringing up many heavy guns to the Belgian front. The midnight French official report states that during Sunday, the, the artillery duel was resumed with great intensity in the region of Dixmude and in the district north of that city. For some time, the Belgians have been reporting an increase in the German activity there. The signs of the enemy massing guns and troops are now unmistakable, and it is entirely probable that a serious offensive will be launched soon on the Belgian front. Berlin reports a number of small engagements along the British lines. In the course of one of these, the Germans entered the British trenches near the Plostre uh, Wood, blew up a sap, and returned with 10 captured British soldiers. The British report states that the enemy were quick, quickly expelled from the trench, penetrated, and left 10 dead behind them. There has been some fighting in the trench, trenches near Givenchy. Germany has probably lost another Zeppelin on the west coast of Norway. A cablegram from Copenhagen states that a Zeppelin, which was no longer under the control of its crew, was observed on the Norwegian coast. Three British destroyers were pursuing it, and when the airship was last seen, it was only about 100 feet above the water. Nothing official comes from London as to this report. There has been another sharp engagement in East Africa between the troops under command of General Smuts and the Germans. The latter concentrated about a week ago in the vicinity of uh, Kilimantide, Kilimantide, I think, Kilimant uh, Kilimantindi, I think, the capital of East Africa. I stopped doing that as well, obsessing, which is on the main line between the coast and Lake Taganika. After this concentration, they proceeded north and attacked General Smuts's forces near Kondoa Rangi. The British drove off the attacking Germans on the night of Tuesday last with severe losses. On Wednesday and Thursday, the Germans resumed their attack. A night, attack. a night assault on Thursday evening was pushed with determination, but once more the Germans were repulsed. The loss of the Br British force in these engagements has been inconsiderable. As the troops brought against them constitute the chief German force for the defense of the East African colony, General Smuts's belief that he had an ample number of men to deal with the enemy is confirmed by these operations. Rome reports very great activity in the upper Adagi Valley of the Trentino and also along the Asanzo front on the Carso Plateau. There have been few infantry actions, but Vienna tells of an Italian attack near San Martino, which it is reported was repulsed after a vicious struggle. The Grand Duke Nicholas, oh yes, this is where he's a, a genius. The Grand Duke uh, Nicholas holds the center of the stage. He is directing no less than five Russian armies operating upon a front of over 500 miles from Trebizond on the Black Sea to a point in Mesopotamia about 90 miles east of Baghdad. These armies are campaigning in regions absolutely devoid of railway facilities and the chief striking forces are separated from each other by great mountain ranges that can be crossed at only by uh, at a few points. Notwithstanding the tre tremendous handicap imposed by nature, the Russian commander, the only man of military genius as distinguished from capacity and ability, who has emerged on either side since the war began, presses steadily forward. The five objectives of his advance are Bybert, Erzingen, Dierkbar, Mosul, and Baghdad. 
Last night, Petrograd reported that a new army of whose operations not, nothing has been known until the last few days and which is striking at the important military center of Mosul on the Tigris has entered the town of Rivendzoa or Rwandiza, thank you, about 80 miles from Mosul and has seized the ammunition depots there. The Turks beat a precipitate retreat, abandoning convoys and war material. The Russian cavalry are in close pursuit. To the Cossack, with a fleeing foe before him, 80 miles of the Mes Mesopotamian plain is not much of an obstacle. Unless the Turks are prepared to see their lines of communication along the Tigris raided and perhaps occupied permanently by the Russians, they must greatly strengthen their forces at both Dirkbar and Mosul. The loss of either of these positions would deprive the Turkish army of Baghdad of its means of supply and its best line of re retreat and would force the Turks to withdraw from Mesopotamia by the Euphrates Valley. Uh, hold on here. There is no indication as of yet of a general offensive by the Allies anywhere along the... And I'm going to pause it for a second. And we're back on the Western Front. Here and there on the heights of the Meuse in Champagne and the south of the Somme, small actions are recorded, in the majority of which the French are the aggressors. But there's no sign of the sustained artillery preparation without which no advance of importance can be attempted. On the 90 miles of the front held by the British Army between the Somme and the Yasser, there are even fewer signs of a disposition to force the fighting. That that great stores of projectiles are accumulating behind the British lines is generally known. The Somme's coming, but it is now mid-May until the anticipated spring advance has not taken place. The only notable activity north of the Somme is that of the Germans along the Yasser. They have greatly strengthened their artillery on the Belgian front and are using it freely. These operations may develop in an attempt to drive the Belgians from the small area of their native land still held by them. So long, however, as the Verdun struggle continues, it is difficult to see where the Germans can obtain men for an offensive of any importance elsewhere on the front. Colonel Remington says that to make up the wastage at, oh, that word, man, at Verdun, the Germans have brought back troops from both Russia and Serbia. If there are signs of concentration along the Yasser, the obvious deduction must be that the troops so concentrated must be coming from Verdun and that the masses of infantry gathered there during the past three months are being dispersed, leaving the big guns to continue the Verdun offensive, or rather to pretend to continue it, for artillery cannot win victories without infantry to follow up its work and occupy the positions smashed by the guns. The Paris Midnight Official Report tells of a surprise attack launched by the French against the German lines on the heights of the Meuse southeast of Verdun. It was completely successful the French patrols cleaned out the German trenches along a front of over 200 yards and brought back some prisoners. There have been no infantry actions north of Verdun during the past 24 hours. The Germans have for the moment changed the scene of their attacks to the Mezin region of Champagne. There are no prolonged artillery duel began there. A prolonged artillery duel began on Sunday night. It was continued during yesterday morning and was followed by a number of infantry attacks directed simultaneously against various points of the French front. All of these attacks were stopped by the French barrage fire or were repulsed by counterattacks. The action begun three days ago in the Dixmude region continues. A B Belgian official report tells of an artillery struggle of great violence followed by an infantry attack by a German detachment which tried to secure a footing in one of the Belgian trenches along the Yasser. The attempt was immediately repulsed. It is officially announced by the British Foreign Office that the outstanding differences between Greece and the Entente powers have been settled amicably. Hmm. With the result there that will be no violation of the neutrality of Greece. Right. This statement leaves a good deal to the imagination. You're damn right it does. The chief cause of friction was the refusal of the Greek government to permit the use of the railways of, of Greece for the transportation of the Serbian army from Corfu to the Macedonian front. It is fair to assume that, the, that General Sarai has won his point in this matter and that it will not be necessary for the Allies to run the risk of transporting the Serbs by sea through the perilous waters around the Greek coast. The Italians have recently destroyed some of the enemy's submarine bases in the Mediterranean, but the danger of submarine attack in the Aegean is still considerable. Last night's British statement told of successful activity in the Hulluk region. 
Infantry secured the lip of a crater thrown up by a German mine. A successful bombardment was also carried out against enemy positions near Fakos, so forget it, and trench mortars were silenced near saint Eloi. Yep, I've really got to <laughs> write these down and try to pronounce ahead of time. My God. The race for Baghdad has been resumed. There is said to be close cooperation between the army of General Lake and that of General Baratov commanding the Russians striking at Baghdad from the east. But a Petrograd dispatch indicates that Russian hopes to reach the city first and secure title by prior occupation. When I read this first, it was reminding me, man, so much of the battle battle for Britain there, the decision games thing. I was like, ooh, you could maybe do the Battle of Baghdad here. The dispatch states that the development of the new line of attack in the direction of Mosul in the rear of the Turkish army has greatly enhanced the chances of success of the Russian campaign in Mesopotamia, which holds forth the hope now entertained in Petrograd of bringing not only Baghdad, the holy city of the caliphs, but the entire historic country between the Tigris and the Euphrates under Russian dominion. It may be that Berlin, uh, sorry, Britain, having had a somewhat unhappy experience in the upper Tigris, has decided to cooperate with Russia and lead the settlement of claims to the Euphrates and Tigris valleys to a later date. The Petrograd official report issued last night says, in the direction of Mosul, our advance continues. London believes that the Baghdad Railway, which is in operation most of the way between Baghdad and Mosul, has already been cut. This would endanger the retreat hold on, I'm gonna grab my mouse of the Turkish army based on Baghdad and believed that believed to number between 80,000 and 90,000 men. The result of the un, unexpected Russian blow at Mosul should be known in a few days. There are no natural obstacles of importance nor any strong fortifications between the Russians and their objective. The Austrians have scored heavily in the Trentino. An official dispatch from Vienna says that at various points in the valleys of the Sugano and the Cagnola, and in the region south of Rovereto, the Austrian forces, aided by an overwhelming artillery fire, captured the first line Italian positions and took prisoner 65 officers and more than 25 Italian soldiers. In addition, seven guns and 11 machine guns were taken. It is not specifically stated that these actions all took place yesterday, but this is left to be inferred by the reader. In addition to this important success in, Al in Alpine warfare, the Austrians report three wins on the Asanzo front, which yielded 415 prisoners. Rome reports that Austrian troops have abandoned their advanced positions before Rovereto and are concentrating farther up the Adagi in anticipation of an Italian offensive against Trent. There are now 300,000 Austrian troops in the Trentino, and they are feverishly at work strengthening the defenses of the Adagi Valley. Hold on, I'm going to grab my mouse. British troops have reached a notable success on the Vimy Ridge, just east of Neuville saint vaast and about midway between Arras and Lens. After effective mining operations, the Lancashire Fusiliers, in a gallant charge, took about 250 yards of German first-line trenches. Heavy losses were inflicted on the enemy. Some efforts of the foe at other points to enter British trenches were repulsed. The Verdun operations drag. The Germans continue their bombardment of the Avalcourt Woods, Hill 304, and Dead Man's Hill, but there's no strength in the infantry attacks that follow. The French Midnight Report states that a tentative attack against the French positions to the west of Hill 304 was stopped by barrage fire. In Champagne, there was an affair of outposts near the hill of Mez Mezin, in which the, or Mesnil, Mesnil, uh, I'm doing it again. The Germans were the aggressors, but failed in a surprise attack on a small French post. The most significant news of the day is the continuation of particularly violent artillery engagements on the Belgian front. The Germans continue to direct a heavy fire against the Belgian positions north of Dixmude. The Belgians, believing a serious purpose lies behind this prolonged bombardment, have now concentrated the fire of their heavy guns against the German lines on the east bank of the Yasser. A move from Verdun to the coast of the North Sea would be a big one. But it begins to appear that the German circus has taken it. Some time ago, it will be remembered, Dutch reports spoke of heavy concentrations of German troops in the region south of, south of Bruges. Nothing happened immediately afterwards to verify these statements. It may be that persistent wet weather and the cons consequent floods have delayed the German movement until now. 
Russia is not likely to ignore the danger that threatens her on the Baltic. The news that a fleet of German battleships, including the Hindenburg, which is believed to mount 15-inch guns, has left the Kiel Canal for Riga, presages fierce fighting in the Gulf of Riga. Were a strong German naval force to come within striking distance of the city of Riga and operate in cooperation with General Hindenburg's army, it is doubtful if the city would be held against the combined attack. The Germans are giving a theatrical touch to the venture by dispatching the battleship Hindenburg to aid the general after whom it was named. Russia's best means of meeting the German naval menace will be by submarine attack. Nothing has been heard this season as to the presence of British submarines in the Baltic, but they're there. Everything possible has been done by the Germans to prevent their in ingress from the North Sea, and nets have been laid almost within the waters of Denmark to uh, to compass that end. It is doubtful if there will be need for British submarines to enter the Baltic this season. Russian ha Russia has, ha has had 15 modern submarines in process of construction in the Baltic since the fall of 1914. They should be ready for sea, sea now and managed by British submarine crews, which can be brought in by way of Archangel in a week's time. They should be able to make a deal of trouble for any German fleet lying in the Gulf of Riga. The chief difficulty in the way of submarine operations there is the shallowness of the water. At no point in the depth greater than 132 feet and in the vicinity of the city of Riga, the water is insufficient to float the largest merchantmen that frequent the Gulf. They have to be loaded at a suburb, suburb near the river mouth. As submarines are quite visible to airplane scouts when submerged to a depth of 100 feet, there will be constant danger in prosecuting submarine warfare in the southern end of the Gulf. The waters of the Baltic are deep, however, and much may happen before the Hindenburg and her consorts begin to drop shells upon the warehouses of Riga. All right, I'm going to hit the pause. And here we go again. The Austrian offensive in the Trentino is upon a large scale and is producing results unexpectedly important. Vienna reports that since the drive down the valley of the Adagi be began, 141 officers and 6,200 Italian soldiers have been captured. In planning this advance, the Austrians have evidently made full use of the railway and the roadway which occupy the valley of the Adagi. By way of Trent, Rovereto, and Mori, the conquerors from the north have usually descended into the Italian plain, striking at Verona, which lies about 20 miles south of the mountain range that marks the present uh, frontier. Checked by the strength of the defenses of Rovereto, the Italians early in the campaign gave up the idea of a direct advance of the Adagi Valley toward Trent and have been seeking by enveloping mo movements directed from both east and west to force the Austrians to withdraw from Riva, Rovereto, and other strong positions in the southern Trentino. A few days ago, it seemed that the Italians were about to succeed in this plan. For the announcement was made that the inhabitants of the Adagi Valley were leaving their villages under the compulsion of Austrian troops. This step was believed to indicate evacuation by the enemy of his southerly positions and concentration near Trent. It is now seen that the driving force, the driving of these Italian subjects of Austria from their homes was a precautionary measure to prevent the Italians from learning the details of the Austrian plans for a forward movement. It was known that 300,000 Austrians had been concentrated in the Tyrol, but it could hardly have been known that most of them were in the valleys and hills in the region between Trent and Rovereto. The Austrians must have struck an overwhelming force to sweep up 6,350 prisoners in a region so difficult as that in which the drive took place, where isolated positions on mountain tops and in passes at high altitudes are held by small groups of men because of the impossibility providing supplies and munitions for larger numbers. The Austrian planes hold on here, probably do not contemplate a de descent to the Italian plane. The chief object was doubtless to break the Italian stranglehold on the lower Trentino. If that was the purpose, it has been fairly well accomplished. And it's interesting, like I said, it's it's neat to hear sometimes when the, you know they're giving the other the other side uh, you know kudos kind of thing. The Italian report admits that in the zone between the Terragnola Valley and the upper Estaco, and a violent concentration of artillery fire of all calibers induced us yesterday to effect another rectification of our front. 
and to abandon some advanced positions. This admission is accompanied by the cheering news that in the Langarina Valley, the Austrians failed utterly in their attack and suffered enormous losses. Numerous bodies being swept away by the Adagi River current. In the Asago sector also, the Austrians lost heavily and made no progress. Finally, in the Sugana Valley, the enemy's rush was stopped by counterattacks, which left 300 Austrian prisoners in the hands of the Italians. 300 from 6,350 still leaves the enemy a long lead. There was great artillery activity in the Verdun region yesterday on both sides of the Meuse, but no infantry engagements. The French military writers have finally dismissed the possibility of a German victory there and declare that the net result of the three month struggle has been the loss of 300,000 Germans killed or wounded who cannot be replaced. The Verdun struggle has been declared at an end so often only to be resumed later, that would it, it would not be safe to dismiss it altogether from the place it has occupied in the public mind till Germany begins to remove her siege howitzers to some other sphere of action. As matters stand, however, the, German, uh, the French are warranted in declaring that Verdun is the greatest German defeat since the war began. Aerial combats in the Verdun region yesterday numbered no less than 33. Three German machines were brought down and not a single French one. Elsewhere, two other German airplanes were destroyed. The French aviators bombed many points behind the enemy's lines. In the House of Commons, Mr. Tennant strongly denied reports that Germany had established aerial supremacy as against British aviators. There were better machines than the Fokker coming into action on the British side. Non-military aviation experts do not think much of the British biplanes for swift aggressive aerial warfare. The French monoplanes are more difficult to handle because of their lack of stability, but the records show that they do pr produce results. A report covering the fortnight's operations on the Salonika front states that since the 1st of May, there's been no important change. No serious infantry, act, uh, infantry engagements have been fought. The artillery on both sides have been busy. The Allies have occupied Dovatepe, while other forces are reported as having advanced towards Monastir. The other forces spoken of are all in probability Serbs from Corfu. The Allies may not make their main advance when the time for an advance comes, but the Allies may not make their main advance when the time for an advance comes by the Valley of the Vardar, where the enemy has mounted many guns. They may have the choice of almost 100 miles of frontier between Monastir and Kavala, where fairly good railway accommodation all the way parallel to the border. It is officially announced that a British monitor, the M30, has been sunk by the fire of Turkish batteries in the Mediterranean. Two men were killed and two wounded in the engagement, which took place on the night of 13th of May. When the British battleships were withdrawn from the Gallipoli operations because of the danger from submarine attack, monitors were substituted. They have been used freely in the eastern Mediterranean ever since. Neither there nor on the Belgian coast has any monitor been destroyed by the explosion of a torpedo, which proves conclusively that they are reasonably submarine proof. But they are not immune to the fire of heavy guns, as Saturday's engagement proves. I think this is almost it. The British official report tells of bombing operations by Seaforth Highlanders near uh, Rolincourt, which were most successful. There have been much artillery activity and many aer aerial engagements have taken place. On Tuesday, 27 aerial duels occurred during which three German and two British machines were put out of action. There is little official news from the Caucasus save the statement that in the direction of Dierkbar, a Tur Turkish attack was repulsed. An unofficial report places the number of Turks captured during the past three weeks by the Grand Duke Nicholas's armies at 37,000 men. The pressure on the British army of the Tigris has been greatly lessened by the withdrawal of 20,000 Turks, from Kut el Amara to face the Russians advancing on Baghdad. Sir Percy Lake will seek to advance the moment the Tigris floods subside to su sufficiently enable him to do so. And there has been sharp fighting at many points on the European Russian front, particularly in Kurland, where the Germans southeast of Riga attacked twice unsuccessfully after releasing oh, poisonous gas. In the Volian sphere of operations, the Russians are advancing west of Ulika. That's it. And like I said, I'll try to do my pronunciation better, but it's going to take some time. Anyways, I uh, hope to see you on Saturday. See you later.